A word of warning regarding the commentary in this video. I've got a new microphone, and it was a bit funky with the sensitivity whilst recording, so there's a few moments where the audio may distort. It's hopefully not too severe, but it's the sort of thing I'm deeply paranoid about, so here's your advance notice. Ideally, it'll be sorted for the next video, but until then, here's this week's for your eyes and ears. Hello everyone, I'm Matt, and today we're going back to basics with a Xeon Legend. For today's build, I'm back in the shed, back in full voice, and back to building high-grade Gumpla, as the time's finally come for me to build the legendary Campfer from 1989's Mobile Suit Gundam War in the Pocket. The Campfer is easily my favourite Xeon Mobile Suit, with its design feeling heavy duty and aerodynamic simultaneously. Of course, the considerable weaponry strapped to it also helps my opinion. And yet, even though it's my favourite suit, I've never actually built one. For a long time now, I'd been planning to pick up the oft-reprinted Master Grade, but that thing dates back to 2001, and the last time I built a Master Grade that old, it was a bit of a rough experience. That, and the incoming metal build figure, is 360 quid! So, as you can probably tell from the title of this video, I ended up with the High Grade. Released in 2008, it's still a rather old kit, but not nearly as old as me, old kit. That said, I did want to pull out all the stops for this build, or at least a good few of them, which led to a bit of experimentation throughout. Inside the box looks pretty standard for a high grade from the time. Nine runners, including beam saber effects and polycaps, and a surprisingly small sheet of stickers, including the usual mono eye, with two spurs, and two white stripes for the head and left shoulder. However, as will become painfully apparent later on in the build, that doesn't mean the colour accuracy is spot on. There's a heck of a lot of yellow missing compared to the source material, and with no stickers required, my Gundam markers will be getting yet another decent workout. There's also a very long piece of wire included, but I won't be seeing that again until the build of the weapons. The construction gets off to a relatively simple start with the head, which consists of just four pieces of plastic, plus a couple of stickers, the lack of a moving mono eye is a little disappointing, given the feature had already appeared in kits at this point. But besides that, the head is very nicely captured, with no major clean-up to do. I elected to forego the sticker on the head fin, instead using a Pilot Supercolor white paint pen. This pen isn't unlike the paint type Gundam markers, but it has a much thinner tip, and a much worse smell. As with those Gundam markers, I also found best practice was to dab paint on gradually, until an even coat was achieved. In this case, it did take a couple of goes, but I was quite happy with the overall results, as small as they are. The only other modification I made was applying some metallic red Gundam marker to the eye sticker. This was more as an experiment, but it ended up producing a sort of glowing effect when dry, which I reckon pops a bit more versus the original flat pink shade. The torso is where I put most of the work into the kit, but that's partially because things didn't go entirely to plan. I did find the nub marks a little stubborn, even with a rather patient approach to cutting and sanding, but overall the visual impact can be reduced to a level I found acceptable. Whilst the design is very unique, the build still shows a lot of similarities with other Gumpla, mainly in where the polycaps end up. Speaking of those polycaps, I did find them a little tough to get into place. I used tweezers to get the waist joint in situ, while the shoulder joints took some serious effort just to push in. I noticed on the Mephus as well, that the polycaps felt a little tougher than usual, so I have to wonder if Bandai have quietly made some changes to the plastic composition in recent reprints. One more aspect to note is that some yellow inserts are actually provided for the chest verniers, which look fantastic. There was a seam line in the centre of the chest that I attempted to clean up, but owing to how thin the piece was, and the slightly generous amount of plastic glue I applied, it looked rather rough afterwards. In the end, I did what I usually do when seam line removal goes south. I chopped up some spur runner, glued it into place over the seam line, and sanded it into what looked like an additional slab of armour. And that's something the camphor probably could have done with, given its fate in the anima. The final piece of the puzzle with the torso was something I'd wanted to try out for a while. Replacing the plastic piping on the kit with fabric varnish tube. This material was used on the Master Grade camphor's pipes, 
and I wanted to recreate it on the high grade, as it's a technique I've always loved the look of. Fortunately, Bandai released a pack of add-on pieces for their 30-minute missions line last year that includes some varnish chew, so I picked a couple of packs up for this build. I imagine the included joints will come in handy at some point and all. As for equipping the camphor with these tubes, it was a bit of a trial and error process. My initial plan was just to cover the original plastic piping with the tube, but it was a little too large, so I had to take a more involved approach. I started by slicing the pipes up, removing the area that plugged into the camphor from the larger piece. Next, I plugged the pieces in and drilled a small hole into each one. Afterwards, I cut the bendable wire included in the 30 minute missions joint set to the size I required for each segment of piping, and inserted it into the holes. Once I was happy with the fit and appearance, I glued one end into place, to make equipping the varnish tube a bit easier. Finally, the varnish tube itself went on. I did find it somewhat prone to fraying when cut though, so my advice would be to use proper fabric scissors for a cleaner cut that is less likely to fray. Now you may be thinking a better approach would have been to simply run one long wire throughout the kit, followed by the varnish tube for a more seamless appearance. And you'd be right. Why didn't I do that? Why am I having this epiphany right after building the thing? Truly, the mind boggles. I did also cut away the moulded piping in the neckline, and super glued some spur varnish tube in there for a consistent appearance. This was a much simpler process compared to the waste piping though. Finally, I painted the first bits of yellow onto the kit, inside the back verniers and the vents just outside the neckline. The construction of the arms is a mixed bag, mainly when it comes to cleaning it up. As tends to be the case on high grades at this point, the shoulders are two pieces that combine, leaving a rather big seam line down the centre. The good news is that on this kit, the shoulder is designed so that the seam line doesn't extend into the spike, which is helpful, although there is still a minor mould line to remove. The seam lines are also pretty easy to deal with, just glue them and sand until an even colour and finish are achieved. In terms of best practice, I recommend giving the pieces a good wipe with a dry cloth after each round of sanding, as I find it aids in preventing discoloration. The rest of the arm is designed so that any seam lines are hidden, but this considered approach is slightly undermined by the back of the forearm. For starters, I found the nub marks rather severe, and even after putting some serious elbow grease into my sanding, a small stress mark remained. Furthermore, there's a glaring mould line running lengthways down the piece. As with the shoulder spike, it's not too tough to clean up, but it's far from ideal if you take a simpler approach to building. Structurally, the arm is pretty satisfying to snap up though, with pieces clicking into place nice and securely. The use of Polycap 9 in the forearm is a bit peculiar though. It's inserted lengthways, so there's no potential for a double jointed elbow bend. With that said, I doubt one would be feasible on this kit without alterations to the armour anyway. Paint wise, I did bring the pilot marker out again for the stripe on the left shoulder spike. However, I struggled to get a finish I was happy with this time round, finding the results rather lumpy in appearance. I ended up stripping the marker and utilised the provided sticker instead. The border where each side meets is visible, but it's situated on the bottom of the piece, so it's not a particularly glaring problem. The waist was snapped together in about 10 seconds, as I find is usually the case with high grades, but it's still perfectly spot on to the source material, so it doesn't really need any extra bells and whistles. What it did need, however, is some more yellow paint on both the front and back vents. Given inserts were provided for the chest, I'm surprised they didn't provide any more on the kit, even if these small details only need a few drops of Gundam marker to look the part. There is also a pair of seam lines running down the sides of the midsection, but given the whole thing is barely visible under the camphor's torso piping, I didn't bother sealing it up. Building the legs is a pretty simple affair, with engineering and construction not too far removed from other kits in this time period. For instance, the ankle joint construction is nigh identical to the high grade M1 Astray from Gundam Seed, released four years later. The seam lines here are also handled pretty well, mostly disguised as panel lines or hidden by other pieces. There is one to clean up on the back of each leg, but given it'll be out of sight in most poses, I don't think sealing it up is essential. 
As for the feet, they're literally three big pieces, so you won't be getting any articulation out of them besides the ankles. Unfortunately, the legs also contain the one aspect of the kit where I reckon Bandai dropped an absolute clangor, especially for people who don't paint their kits. There's absolutely no yellow plastic here, even for the large yellow segments on the sides of the lower legs. I could understand not providing stickers for the inner verniers. I can't imagine they'd have stuck to the raised areas very well. But the camphor really doesn't look right without that large chunk of yellow on the sides. The good news is that with just yellow Gundam marker, some masking tape, and a heck of a lot of patience, you can get a pretty respectable job done. As with the pilot marker earlier, my advice is to slowly dab on the paint, watch where it flows, and fill in any areas where the paint hasn't travelled to. You may need to do some touch-ups, but make sure to let the first coat dry, because dealing with half-dried Gundam marker is not pleasant. As with earlier, I also filled the many verniers with yellow, although I took a deliberately less polished approach to this. I wanted them to be yellow, but also worn, like the paint had been damaged over time. I tidied up any overspill by lightly sanding the rim of each vernier. The only other painting I did here was down to personal preference, as I wasn't a big fan of the armour layering on the upper leg. It's blue plastic on top of blue plastic, and whilst that's spot onto the anime, I thought it was a bit boring. That, and the seam line down the upper leg, whilst also anime accurate, wasn't to my taste either. I have form for disliking intentional seam lines though, as in with my Mephus build. I ended up lobbing a rather generous helping of GM45 onto the inner area, and whilst not as accurate as mentioned, I do personally prefer the appearance. It somewhat minimises the visual impact of the seam line, whilst also implying some extra colour separation. I also think the black poking through the blue armour evokes the rather chunky panel line seen on other mobile suits of the era, like the Gundam GP-01 Full Vernon, which is no bad thing in my book. More often than not, I don't put much work into the guns on my kits. They do tend to suffer from prevalent seam lines, particularly on high grades, but because of that common occurrence, it doesn't tend to hurt me as much as seam lines on the main kit. This time was different, however, partially because I was already doing a lot of work on the kit, and also because I was experimenting again. Whilst on holiday in York, I popped into the glorious Monk Bar model shop on Goodrum Gate, and finally acquired something many model builders swore by, a bottle of Tamiya Extra Thin Cement. As such, the weapons became guinea pigs in my plastic glue shootout. An event which, given the amount of solvents involved, is probably just as dangerous as an actual shootout, so keep a door or window open and mask up. In order to compare and contrast, I sealed up both shotguns and bazookas, one with the Tamiya cement, and the other with my usual go-to Citadel plastic glue. I found that for best results, a rather liberal amount of the Tamiya was required, rather than just tracing along the seam lines as I usually would. However, once I got a bit more to grips with it, I started getting a more consistent finish, and I also found the overspill far easier to deal with compared to Citadel's plastic glue. I'll keep trying out the Tamiya cement on other upcoming projects, but so far I feel pretty optimistic about it. As for the Citadel glue, I do find it requires a bit more precision, as the aforementioned overspill can react rather poorly to being sanded, something that happened earlier on this build with the torso. That said, I do find that once the glued pieces are combined, it does leave more of an indicator as to where to clean up, and on one of the shotguns I ended up with a bit of a nicer finish as a result. After all the seam lines were dealt with, I moved on to the model kit equivalent of a very first world problem. The bazookas are identical, with the sight being on the same side. This isn't a problem that necessarily needs solving, given the camphor only uses one bazooka at a time in the art and fiction. But I wanted it to dual wield, and I wanted it to be symmetrical while doing so. So I got to work relocating the sight of one bazooka to the opposite side. I achieved this by first covering up the tab for the sight using, as always, some spur runner. Afterwards, I sliced up the sight itself, and I rebuilt it so that it would attach to the other side. It was a rather rough job, but a good chunk of sanding, panel lining, and the final top coat did make it bed in a little more, so I'm satisfied, even if it was a slightly pointless endeavour. The rest of the weapon rebuilding was pretty standard. Besides that seam line removal, as well as a mould line to remove on the stock of the shotguns, it's all about as simple as high-grade weaponry tends to be. 
Likewise, the iconic chain mine is rendered with very little effort for a lot of reward. It does involve snapping up multiple identical pieces, but it's such a quick process that it doesn't get to feeling repetitive. As shown in the manual and anime, I did also chuck some yellow Gundam marker onto the circular details, which really pops against the darker grey of the mines. With the kit now snapped up, it was time to panel line and decal the thing, and owing to the latter, I knew I'd be top coating as well. This meant flow type markers were mostly off the table, as I was wary of them running as on my real grade double O's and riser. As such, my fine liner type grey Gundam marker was used for the majority of the panel lining, and I used GM45 on the whole vent thingies on the suit's backpack and arms. As for the grey armour pieces, I used my Unipin black fine liner, specifically the 0.05 gauge model. For the water slide decals, I picked up Gundam Decal 54, which contains a variety of markings for Xeon mobile suits from War in the Pocket. Although there's only three decals specifically for the high grade camp for her, with the master grade version getting the bulk of the attention, you still get plenty of serviceable warning signs and specific logos, such as the Xeon military rankings and the insignia of Cyclops Team. As usual, I did grab some markings from other sheets for a bit more variety, but overall I took a minimalist approach, with small markings complementing moulded detail. Top coating was relatively painless, thanks to some very timely sunshine, but I was initially a bit too generous with my Humbrol varnish. I had the can quite close to the model, and whilst the results weren't atrocious, they did look a little patchy under certain lighting. I did also encounter a couple of instances where the panel lines started running, although not as much as on the Zan Riser. After using Montana Gold as much as I have, I think I've gotten a bit too used to spraying up close, as those cans tend to require. So once I'd applied some more Humbrol varnish, this time from further away, I got a much more even finish. As commonly recited, around 30cm seems to be a good distance to maintain between can and model. Once the top coat was dried, I then applied some plated silver onto the rivet light details on the shoulders. I found that on the Zan riser, the top coat unsurprisingly removed the chrome finish from the paint, so I recommend leaving any detailing with that pen until afterwards. And here's the completed high grade camphor, fully armed and ready to wipe the floor with anything in its path, as long as that path doesn't include a rotary cannon. I've absolutely no complaints when it comes to how the finished kit looks. It's physically spot on to the source material, with great proportions and moulded detail. Even without the additions I made, I reckon it'd still look great out of the box with some panel lining. That said, a simple snap build won't be entirely accurate owing to the seam lines and, more pressingly, the glaring lack of yellow on the legs and verniers. The latter, although disappointing still, is quite understandable given the size of said verniers. Structurally, the kit is pretty solid too. I didn't find much trouble with pieces feeling loose or floppy. The articulation isn't mind-blowing, but I put that down to the kit's age as well as the suit's design. For instance, the knee joint's range of motion is rather curtailed by the verniers on the back of the upper leg. In practice, this means the camphor can't really crouch or kneel effectively. There's also aspects that were pretty common on a few kits at this time, like the single jointed elbows and ball jointed hips. However, I think these limitations have been mitigated to a degree. The lower arm design still provides an elbow bend over 90 degrees, and the hip ball joints possess rather generous outwards movement, so the kit can still achieve a fairly wide stance. The ankles also have a rather good range of side to side and front to back movement, even if some poses can expose the polycaps inside the legs. It's not super obvious, but it may bug you depending on how you want to display the kit. The camphor also doesn't possess any major gimmicks, as with the last couple of kits I've reviewed. Instead, its main draw is the sheer amount of weaponry it possesses, and it's all been rendered fairly nicely, even in the simpler high grade format. The result of all this equipment is a huge variety of display options, and the kit continues to look fantastic whatever you equip it with. For a more natural pose, the trigger finger hands are angled, and this also assists the suit in holding the shotgun, which can be built with or without the stock segment. A giant robot with a shotgun is always a big deal in my view, but a giant robot with two shotguns? Well, that's unmissable. The trigger fingers don't hold onto the rocket launchers quite as well, 
but the angled grip, coupled with the moving handle piece, make the weapon just as easy as the shotgun to equip. The two beam sabers are simple as always, with a nice beam effect provided. As tends to be the case with the high grades I've built on here so far though, the hands don't hold onto them very well, so I don't think inverting the handle will be feasible here. The same grip issues apply to the stern fosts, so I'll probably just be leaving them on the legs. Finally, I was expecting the chain mine to be a little challenging to pose, but Bandai pulled it off really well. The handle actually clips into the palm of the holding hand, and it does so very securely. Plus, the included wire is more than capable of holding up the long train of mines, and I spent loads of time treating it like the world's scurriest gymnastics ribbon. A good chunk of the canvas iconic silhouette comes from the weapon storage, particularly the rocket launchers mounting onto the back, and they clip onto the backpack here with no fuss. Or rather they would have had I not modded the sight on one earlier. As a result of me swapping the side it was on, the sight on the left launcher ends up clashing a bit with the left shoulder spike, which can affect the angle the launcher sits at. The solution is to swap the launchers over, but then you've got the launcher for the right arm on the left side, and vice versa, so it's a bit odd. There's also a simple but welcome clip for one of the shotguns on the back skirt, and two adapters for connecting the stern forsts. The beam sabers officially store inside the upper legs, but on this kit, the handles are already moulded in, so there's no actual storage options for the sabers. To be fair, I feel like that might have been a tough task on a kit of this size and grade, but I imagine someone somewhere's modded it in regardless. The chain mine doesn't have any storage either, but it wasn't an official part of the camphor's armoury, so that makes a bit more sense. To wrap up, the high grade camphor is a kit I had an enormous amount of fun putting together, and I think the experimenting I did with the varnish tube and rocket launcher site really paid off. But modified, it's a relatively simple build you could probably put together in a single evening, but it still holds its own against more complex kits thanks to its unique design and large variety of display options with an awesome selection of weapons. With all that said, it's worth keeping in mind the decent amount of work I did put into this build, as a straight built kit will be missing much of the yellow, with no stickers provided. The seam lines on the shoulders and legs need dealing with too, even if the bulk of those seam lines are mitigated by design. I do reckon this would be an excellent kit for practicing skills like painting, either with Gundam marker or brush, and sealing up seam lines. However, without all that work, I don't think the kit will feel quite as satisfying when complete, although it's far from terrible. Well that more or less summarises my thoughts on the high grade camphor, a build that's arguably ended up reflecting how much I've learned about Gunpla thus far. I'll be building his main opponent, the Gundam NT1, at some point down the line, however I've got quite a backlog to go through, so that might take a while. Until next time though, thanks for watching, and take care everyone.